Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much. We're so pleased to be able to bring you the information that we have to share with you about what really is a serious, and I mean serious, worldwide problem. We know firsthand because our story travels through the journey of what happens to individual people and to a marriage when pornography is involved in it. And we're here to tell you tonight that not only is it a serious problem, but we also have the way to God's way to get us out of that problem. So thank you for being here. Good evening. If we look at the scripture passage in Hosea, my people perish from lack of knowledge, we will get the view for what we want to share with you tonight. And that is that many of us have no understanding of the dangers of pornography on the internet and, and how different it is and how it has grabbed individuals. We also are unaware of how to heal ourselves when we're in this situation and how to turn to God's plan for that healing. And so those who are enrolled in the program that we're sharing with you tonight are actually called students. They're not clients, they're not patients, they are students who are learning a way out of this dangerous situation. And the other scripture passage, my saving power will rise on you like the sun and bring healing like the sun's rays, is what we found. We found hope and healing through this resource and this program. And so we took early retirement so we could volunteer to travel literally around the world to tell people about this amazing resource that helped us move out of this horrendous, horrible pornography addiction. So moving on, when we look at what it is that we need to address, both in understanding the problem and finding healing with this, we found four words, to pray, to educate, to equip, and to encourage. So we want to compliment you for being here tonight to move into that step of education. But as we go, we need to start with the foundation, which is prayer. And so we turn to St. Monica and St. Augustine. As we know, St. Monica prayed for the conversion of her son, who was involved in very unhealthy sexual behaviors. And those prayers were answered. And so we ask St. Monica and St. Augustine, please teach us to pray. And then Our Lady of Good Help is the first approved apparition of Mary in North America, and it's very close to our center. And so our ministry has been consecrated by our bishop, Bishop David Ricken, to Our Lady of Good Help. And she appeared to a young woman, Adele Bryce, and told her, go out and teach in this wild country. Well, our country is very wild when it comes to our unhealthy sexual behavior. And so again, we are all being called to do the teaching. So please, Our Lady of Good Help, teach us to educate. And St. Joseph, he provided for that holy family. And so we ask him to teach us how to equip for the healing of families. And St. Rita, who prayed and encouraged her husband to change his lifestyle, we ask her to be our patron to teach us to encourage. And St. Michael the Archangel, we seek that he defend us in this battle because this is a battle between good and evil. And so we begin. And it is time for all of us to pray, to educate, to equip, and to encourage one another in what is needed to overcome pornography. But let's start with understanding what is pornography. It's pictures or stories created with the direct intention of arousing lust in the viewer or reader. So when you see a, a book like Fifty Shades of Grey move up to the, one of the best sellers when it is filled with such vile, unhealthy sexual activities, we recognize it is not just print paste, but that especially women are finding this type of a book as something they want to read really tells us the dangerous state we are in as a culture. Now, pornography, according to the Catechism of the Catholic Ch Church definition, says pornography consists in removing real or simulated sexual acts from the intimacy of the partners in order to display them deliberately to third parties. It offends against chastity because it perverts the conjugal act, the intimate giving of spouses to each other. It does grave injury to the dignity of its participants, actors, vendors, the public, since each one becomes an object of base pleasure and illicit profit for others. It immerses all who are involved in the illusion of a fantasy world. It is a grave offense. Civil authorities should prevent the production and distribution of pornographic materials. So we move along and we look at this. Along with pornography comes all these other unhealthy sexual behaviors that are all interrelated and interconnected. So hooking up, one night stands, phone sex, sexual chat rooms, sexting, masturbation, 
strip clubs, illicit massage and sex parlors, and many more. And so we need to define some of these other words that are involved in this. So masturbation, the deliberate stimulation of the genital organs in order to derive sexual pleasure. And again, the Catechism of the Catholic Church speaks on this. Masturbation is an intrinsically and gravely disordered action. Instead of training a person in faithfulness in order to make gift of oneself, masturbation trains a person in selfishness. Now, years ago, when I was in Catholic grade school, I remember the nuns telling us that masturbation was wrong and that if we did masturbate, we would go blind and we would have mental illness. Now, many people, when I share that statement, they smile, as, as some of you are, or they, they kind of chuckle. Well, you know, those nuns were right. And scientific discoveries are showing that. And from a testimony from our own lives, my husband became very blind. He no longer saw women with their entirety as made in the image and likeness of God, but he began to see them as just body parts. Well, that's as blind as you can get. And then mental illness we will share later what happens to the brain and what happened to my husband's mind, where he almost lost his job and where he was unable to continue to function and basically had a complete mental breakdown as a result of his activities with pornography. So this is true, what those nuns said, and we forget to pass this information on. And the sexual world, the societal world is saying it's healthy to engage in masturbation, and they're encouraging our youth to do that. So we as Catholics need to be strong in our voice to say that this is, as our catechism says, a gravely disordered action. And along with masturbation of comes fantasy, and that is using the imagination to assist the impure act of lust and or masturbation. Now, voyeurism, we always thought of this as kind of that peeping Tom. It's the watching or listening to people engaged in intimate behaviors or private conversations. Well, today we've all been conditioned to be voyeurs, and many of us don't even realize we are. If you're watching a TV show like The Bachelor or The Bachelorette, you're involved in voyeurism, and that is a sin. It's wrong. If we look at our movies and how in our movies we're engaged in viewing these intimate acts between people, and quite often they're people who aren't even married. So compounding the gravity of this. And now we have sexting and the sharing of images off our cell phones and our computers. The shamelessness that's occurring, flaunting the body without conscience, false notion of sexual freedom, and even to the point where, again, some kind of a TV show like Dancing with the Stars, all the provocative clothing that's being worn and the suggestive comments and acts. And for us to look at modesty, it is a virtue that protects the mystery of persons and their love. It encourages patience and moderation in loving relationships. Modesty is decency. It guides how one is to look at others, to dresses and behaviors, and that too is from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, all of this leads into lust. And again, the Catechism says, lust is disordered desire for an inordinate enjoyment of sexual pleasure. Sexual pleasure is morally disordered when sought for itself, isolated from its procreative and unitive purposes. And so what it, we really need to do, if we look where we are at as a culture, our bishop said we need to reclaim the culture for Christ. So not only reclaim sexual health, but literally get involved to reclaim our culture for Jesus Christ. So we need to go back to the beginning, to Adam and Eve, and how they had a choice in the Garden of Eden. And they were either going to follow God's plan or listen to Satan. Well, we have the same choice today, to either follow God's plan or follow what the Satan is still trying to encourage us to do. So Satan is still using the apple. He can't be very creative. And you look at the image on our computers of an apple, I wonder, is this just coincidence? Or is it becoming evil so very bold? But either way, we're still following that same story of seeking self-gratification. And in Genesis, it says, a desire for self-gratification in our first human parents led to their downfall and sin. And it's continuing to lead to the downfall of us and to sin for all of us. Now, this age of the computer has really made the temptation of pornography a whole lot stronger, and it has changed how it affects individuals. So Bruce is going to share more on that. The thing about internet pornography that makes it so different is the intensity with which it hits, 
the ability of it to get into all of our homes, it's so accessible now. Everybody has a shot at it. You no longer have to go to a bookstore or somewhere to try to buy it. Secondly, it is now affordable. It used to be you had to lay down money to buy pornographic materials. Now so much of it is available and it's totally free and anonymous. This is where you no longer have to worry about being seen going into a part of town to purchase the materials. It's at your beck and call 24 hours a day on your phone, in your homes, wherever you want to watch it. And I want to throw in a fourth A that is not on our slide, but it's aggressive. And as you see as we talk here, pornography no longer is something you have to go out and get. Pornography is coming at us from absolutely every way around us. And that really is a problem. And it was our problem, and it's many people's problem. And we just very briefly want to share with you a little of the history of what we have gone through. When I was nine years old is when I saw my first pornography. It was uh, print-based, and I found it in my father's business. So it was his material. And I knew immediately I had this draw, this feeling that there's something really unique going on here. I don't know what it is, but there's something unique calling me. And so I would continue to go back and look at it again. I also knew innately in my heart there's something very wrong about this. This is not normal. This is not natural. This is not real. And so you put those two things together and imagine the kind of confusion it can cause in a young person's brain. So then growing up, you know, in a neighborhood full of boys and clubhouses and s sleeping out in tents and things like that, there were always boys who were older than me that were buying pornography or stealing it from stores or bringing it to the sleepovers. And so I was constantly getting in and out of looking at pornography as I was growing up in the neighborhood. Then as I began to be older, um, you know, I could get away from it for a while. And in those days, we call it white knuckling. Just, I'm not going to do this anymore. So you run away and hide. But eventually, it would always come creeping back in again in one way, shape, form, or another. And the real, real piece de resistance, if you want to call it that, is when I was in the year 2000, my father died. And I didn't realize really at the moment what was going on, but there was a, a real emotional connection, a real emotional loss, a real sense of grief over the loss of my father and over the loss of the bond that we had, which was hunting, fishing, and sharing pornography. And so now the internet is online in the year 2000, and I found out by following a pop-up and getting on the internet that the internet porn was just so saturating that it just hooked me right in. It became the perfect storm, and I was hopelessly entwined in it for quite a long time in my life, until, until eventually, and you know, college teaching, uh, my wife and I have been in ministry many years, she was always the church lady. She was a family minister. She's trained in ministry. I was the science teacher. So we quite frequently were giving talks to young people uh, called the mad scientist and a church lady, in which we took the latest things about biochemistry and brain and whatever and brought them out to the world about relationships. So I'm going to let her tell you how she found the answer for us after all of the other things I tried to finally get healed First of all, what we found is that both of us very naively, I knew about his pornography problem before we got married, but naively I thought it was about sex. And I thought, well, once we're married, this won't be an issue for him anymore. Well, that's really not the way it works. And so it continued to be an issue. And we saw therapists, and, and they helped with some of the underlying issues. But as he said, the pornography issue still kept creeping up. And at this point in his life, when he was so absorbed into Internet pornography, I didn't know he had gotten into that at that point. But what I did know is this very smart man who taught chemistry at the college level was now getting dumber and dumber and dumber. He was also not able to even pay attention when we were in groups of people talking or even at home he wasn't hearing me. So I took him from one audiologist to the next saying something's wrong with his hearing. And they were saying no there, there isn't. Well finally I, I talked to our physician and I said something's wrong. He's got to have a brain tumor because you know he's a smart man and he, now he's down to nothing. And so they did a uh, functional MRI with him and he said yes there is some serious brain damage and there was basically no blood flow coming to his prefrontal cortex and the left side of the brain which is a very strong part normally in a man it was almost completely shut down but the right side where imagination goes which we now realize was fantasy there was a lot of blood flow and activity only in that part of the brain now many are not trained in some of this cutting-edge science behind this either and our physician tried to figure out what this was and he had had a really bad sinus infection so he thought well it must have been the sinus infection so that's what I believed 
But at that same time, I started doing this internet research for more new brain science for some of the presentations that, that I was giving. And I came across an online program on the brain science of change for pornography. And I thought, oh, I started researching into this, and it described how a person connected in, in internet pornography, when they get really deep into it, they start to lose their ca capacity for, in, for sharing their intelligence. They lose this. And I thought, this must be happening. So Bruce did at that time share with me that, yes, he had been involved in internet pornography. So he was the third student to enroll in this secular online program based on brain science, where they brought together the top psychiatrists, psychologists, the top brain scientists to say there must must be something we can do to really function how to change when the brain gets addicted to this. And they found out some amazing exercises. And he can talk really well again. And he, he's got a pretty smart brain. So we have proof that this works. Now, let's look, though, at what is the profile of a porn addict. And we're specifically talking about someone who would be addicted to online pornography because it affects the brain differently. And the psychiatrists and psychologists that worked on this process came to a conclusion that they were all seen in their practices that they were intelligent people, sensitive people, and spiritual people. Well, he surely was intelligent to teach chemistry at that level. He's so sensitive, he cries at Hallmark commercials more than I do. And he's very spiritual. And we used to stay up at night discussing God. And he had been in the Lutheran tradition and had become Catholic before we got married. So this was a description of my husband to a T. Now, I wish I had known. So many people who are caught up in pornography, and it's not just men, it's women too, are now speaking out and saying, I wish someone had told us ahead of time what this can really do to us. So I want to be able to share some of these with you. I wish that 10 years ago, someone, this was a woman who wrote this, someone had educated me on pornography, what it is, what it does, and what it reaches in and destroys in the hearts, minds, and bodies of men and women. I wish that someone would have told me that researchers have suggested it sabotages your sex life. I wish someone would have explained how dopamine, the chemical that is released every time you experience pleasure, drives you to return to what provided that feeling before. I wish someone would have told me that the kind of pornography you're most turned on by is usually linked to a corresponding hurtful event in your life, further injuring your brokenness. I wish someone would have told me pornography would normalize things I wasn't emotionally or physically ready to handle in my relationships with men, making me feel like I had no options or control over my sex life, filling me with much regret and physical pain. I wish someone would have told me I would begin to objectify men, build up images in my mind and think of sex day in and day out to the point where I couldn't remain focused on anything else. I wish someone would have told me it would make me feel less vulnerable to men and bring up insecurities for years in the bedroom. I wish someone would have pointed out pornography can establish your sexuality completely apart from real life relationships, causing huge problems in your intimacy with real significant others. I wish someone would have explained what sexual anorexia was and that countless young men are unable to get erections because they've been watching porn since they were around 14 years old. I wish someone would have told all the men I've dated that the porn they are watching is keeping them from being sexually interested in me, ultimately destroying our relationship. I wish someone would have told me that the dopamine and oxytocin being released from my watching certain types of pornography would cause me to question my sexual orientation, which in turn cost me relationships with friends. I wish someone would have told me it would subtly create a victim mentality in my mind, causing me to be even more sensitive than I already was to catcalls, whistles, and even sincere compliments. I wish someone would have talked about how women watch it too, so I wouldn't have had to spend years living under the shame that comes with being the only one and thinking there was something wrong with me. My I wish list is nowhere near complete either. In the end, I simply wish someone would have told me why it was so harmful instead of simply, point, uh, simply point, putting it on a list of things we don't talk about. We all know our rights and wrongs, but seldom do we know what makes them so. Had I known how much it would have harmed me, I would have left it alone. 
If you're a woman who has watched pornography or is watching pornography, studies are now showing that we make up more than one-third of pornography viewers. It's no longer a taboo topic, and I would personally like to give you permission to speak openly about it. I guarantee you that you have friends who watch it and are desperate to talk, even in your church, especially in your church. So we need to get out there to educate and to help people find a safe way for hope and healing. So we need to look at how severe this issue is, and it is a pandemic. We all know how sexual immorality is just rampant in our culture and how dangerous it has become for couples, for marriages, and for families. Well, the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, which is the top, nation's top 1,600 divorce attorneys in the U.S. said in 2002, obsessive interest in internet pornography sites was the cause of divorce in 56% of their cases. So this is the number one cause of divorce. And as Catholics, as we uphold the dignity of marriage, we must also uphold healing of those marriages that are falling apart because of this. And we know how it's destroying children. Um, many, many people have the same story as Bruce. They find their father's pornography collection, and now it can be their mother's pornography collection, and all the pain from hearing the fighting and the breakup of the family. Well, look at these shocking statistics. Every second, and look how short a second is, you know, deep, over $3,000 is being spent on pornography. And every second, over 28,000 internet users are viewing pornography. Every second, 372 internet users are typing these adult search terms into the search engines looking for this. And every 39 minutes, a new pornographic video is being created in the United States. And that brings tears to my eyes. Um, I apologize to all of you in the name of my country. A study in Australia showed there were over 500 adult novelty shops in 2003, and now that's grown to 900 in 2007. And you think, well, now people don't need to go there. They can get all this on the Internet. Why would that exist? Well, it's because they've now expanded, besides the, the pornography, to the range of sex toys and erotic clothing and all kinds of paraphernalia. And so the whole industry of this has been booming and growing children in pornography getting hooked into this. Nine out of 10 children age eight to 16 have viewed pornography on the internet. And in most cases, these sites were first gotten on intentionally. Now the average age for the first time of viewing is eight to 11 years old. And 90% of boys and 70% of girls age 13 to 14 have accessed sexually explicit content at least once. Now, the average American adolescent will view 14,000 sexual references on TV per year. And if you turn on the TV, you'll be exposed to 6.7 scenes with sexual content every hour. The largest consumer group of Internet porn is 12 to 17-year-old children. Four out of five 16-year-olds regularly access pornography online. And the recent content analysis on some of the top-selling adult videos show over 3,000 verbal and physical aggressive acts in there. And on average, there's about 11-plus acts of either verbal or physical aggression on all of these. And to look at 48% of the 304 scenes that were analyzed contained verbal aggression, while more than 88% showed physical aggression. 72% of aggressive acts were perpetrated by men, and 94% of aggressive acts were committed against women. Just a few short years ago, if you went to rent a video someplace or a DVD, you'd see the covers of scantily clothed women. And they were very pornographic in the, in the view, even in the, the front section, not, not the back section. That was uh, purposefully doing that. Now if you go in, though, you're going to see images of a lot more violence and blood along with the scantily clothed women that are on these covers. Because we've escalated as a culture to need a bigger hit, kind of like when someone is, is um, becoming an alcoholic. They start with one beer and get a little buzz, but pretty soon they need a whole bottle of whiskey to get that same buzz. Well, what has happened as a culture is just the naked body or the provocative clothed body isn't enough to give a big enough hit anymore. We're too used to it. So now we need to get the adrenaline of some violence, some, something that scares us that goes along with it. 70% of 18 to 24-year-old men visit pornographic websites in a typical month, and 66% of men in their 20s and 30s say they're regular users of pornography. And the sad fact is that it's the same inside the church as it is outside this church. Over 50% of Christian men who go to Christian men events where these surveys are taken 
say that they are addicted to pornography, and over 20% of Christian women report being addicted themselves reporting this, and 37% of pastors admit that cyber porn is a current struggle for them. Now, a survey of over 10,000 Christian men at a church event revealed that 53% of them said that they had used pornography in the last week. Another survey indicated that 40% of senior boys at a Catholic high school were using pornography on a regular basis, and 86% of college students said they had viewed pornography in the last year. Now, the statistics are again growing to show more and more women are getting involved in this. So 9.4 million women access adult uh, pornography, and about a 13% of them admit to accessing pornography while they're at work. And one out of six women grapples with addiction to pornography. One in five men and one in eight women admit to viewing pornography at work, and the heaviest use is 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. When they're caught, they're fired, and many families are running into financial ruin as a result of that. Now, when there's so much free being given out into the Internet, these statistics become very shocking, that the pornography Internet uh, the internet pornography industry is gaining more revenue than all of the top technology companies combined. Microsoft, Google, Amazon, eBay, Yahweh, Apple, Yahoo, I mean, Apple, Netflix, and Earthlink, all of their, their revenue is less than the revenue from the sales of pornography. U.S. porn revenue exceeds the combined revenues of ABC, CBS, and NBC. And this is the real shocking one. Porn revenue is larger than all the combined revenues of all U.S. professional football, baseball, and basketball franchises combined. This is huge. And again, the sad news that the United States is the top producer of Internet porn. Now, from 2009 to 2012, more than 5,000 sexual assaults involved a child perpetrator raping or sexually assaulting another child. Well, children mimic what they see, and they want to be grown up. And what do we tell them grown up means? It's the adult entertainment. That's what pornography is labeled. And they will mimic what they see. And if they see sex acts, many children are going to turn and try to do these acts on vulnerable infants and children nearby. We have Dr. Judith Reisman, who is a real leader in the fight against pornography, who has said exposure to pornography can permanently alter the brain, triggering an instant involuntary but lasting biochemical memory trail. England's National Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Children, the policy advisor Claire Lilly, warned, easy access to, the, to indecent material could be leading to an increase in the number of children needing help by warping young people's views of what is normal or acceptable behavior. Nearly 80% of unwanted exposure to pornography is taking place in the home. Kids experience unwanted exposure through a variety of means, many times by accidentally typing a word or, or getting something wrong while searching for homework. Now, we found this kind of a, a sad cartoon, but it expresses what virtual reality is. You have this, you know, giant uh, tattooed uh, man saying, I got long blonde hair, pouty red lips, and a body like an hourglass. Because on the internet, nobody really knows who you are, so you can lead a whole virtual make-believe life. And the person he's chatting back and forth with says, he's a little skinny guy, and he says, Oh, Rita, my muscular body is shaking with desire. Tell me more. And, you know, we can kind of laugh at this, but the truth is there are people who spend almost their entire lives wrapped up in some fantasy world out there in their virtual reality. And then also scary is what we call reality. And so amateur videography, where amateurs at home are creating more pornography within the walls of their own homes and putting it out on the Internet. And this has really become a very popular form of pornography. And it also happens at a different level, what we call sexting. And where today, many times, in the high school age groups, instead of in my day, you got the boy's ring if he liked you, and if he really liked you, you might get his letter jacket to wear. Now what is the sign? If you're in a relationship, you exchange nude photos over your phones with each other. This has become the new we're in a relationship sign. So sexting is using mobile technology to send a suggestive nude or semi-nude text, picture, or video of oneself to someone else.
Sexting is extremely popular for individuals mainly between the ages of 9 and 18. What we don't recognize is that 28% of teens admit to sexting, and they don't look at the dangers. And there are some real severe short-term dangers of this. Un unintended people seeing the image, humiliation at school, suspension or even expulsion from school, a bad reputation, teasing, rejection, and become an easy target, including for rape and sexual predators, along with the moral issues and, and the, the soul damage. Now, the long-term dangers, unintended people seeing the image, and once it's there, it doesn't leave cyberspace, so they live with the permanence of the activity. More humiliation continually, more p potential for suspension and expulsion, and again, that bad reputation may not leave. And legal consequences can come as well. They may face social repercussions, such as being judged or excluded by peers. The image goes viral and they really have a problem and that can lead to denial of scholarships, college admission, or even job prospects. It can lead to conviction. If a girl sends a photo of herself naked and she's under 18, she can be arrested as in the United States, I'm not sure in, in all the other countries, as a felony for creating and distributing child porn. So she sends it to her 18-year-old boyfriend, and he now can be arrested in a felony for um, having child porn. And if he clicks forward and shares it with somebody else, or in the locker room shares the picture around, he can now be arrested for distribution of child porn. And so they're unaware of this. So again, education to let people know what they're doing. And if that happens, they must register as a sex offender for the rest of their life, and they will have restrictions on housing and where they're able to live. Now, a Massachusetts study suggested that kids involved in sexting are twice as likely to experience psychological distress and even attempt suicide. Now, the Parents Television Council released a new study looking at all the nudity that exists on primetime broadcast television and to see the big change between 2011 to 2012. The study found that there were 76 incidences of full nudity on 37 shows compared to just 15 incidences in 14 shows the previous rating season. So that's a 407 percent rise in incidences in one year. Almost 70 percent of these scenes featured happened prior to 9 p.m compared to 50% of the full nudity scenes which aired before 9 p.m. in the previous year. Now, additionally, the study says five of the 76 full nudity depictions did not warn parents. I mean, only 5% did warn parents about the dangers of that show. And perhaps the most draw dropping, as it says in these articles, finding was it in regard to that full frontal nudity. While just one incidence of this occurred during the 2010-2011 study period, there are 64 documented full frontal incidences that occurred this past season. That's a 6,300% increase. So to really see how we've changed. Now, the Witherspoon industry did a study where they brought together, you know, all legislators, people from the therapeutic community, educators, corporate leaders, and religious leaders. And this group of very diverse people came up, all of them together, with a common belief that testifies to the links between pornography consumption and a wide number of psychological, social, and family pathologies. So this is serious stuff that we're involved in. One therapist that was quoted at this conference said, those who claim pornography is harmless entertainment, benign sexual expression, or a marital aid have clearly never sat in a therapist's office with individuals, couples, or families who are reeling from the devastating effects of this material. And I can testify to this as a family life minister in hearing so many of these stories personally from people in grief. The next segment, Bruce is going to be talking and sharing about what happens in the brain science behind these kinds of pulls that are happening and getting people caught up in this unhealthy behavior. But we thought better than us just telling you stories about people's lives. We are involved in trying to create a documentary that could be showed in the public movie theaters to help people understand what the pain of this shame, of this, this hideous behavior has caused in so many people's lives. So we'd like to share just a clip um, from this called Shame. Average age now of exposure to pornography for children. It used to be 11 and it just keeps going down. 
We didn't even know that pornography was a part of his life when he was six, seven, eight years old. Twelve years old, kids at school brought some, some stuff. It was super exciting. I didn't even know pornography existed. I didn't go looking for it. I was researching for a school project, and one of the videos was a porn video. The fact that it was forbidden made it more alluring. Years later, when I was married, the, the cravings for it came back. I started looking at it again, and that's when I became trapped in it. The understanding of what pornography is and the, I guess, the addictive nature really wasn't fully understood. It can really grab hold and be a, a difficult problem to overcome for anyone. I was extremely naive to what's out there. If you're not looking at pornography today, you're not aware of the level of violence and, and just demeaning, degrading uh, imagery that's involved there. It promotes beliefs and values and ideas that run contrary to what healthy relationships require. It really kind of trivializes sex. It trivializes a real connection. Those expectations interfere with a healthy development of their sexual experience in marriage. I recognize the signs. If I go back into this behavior, it's going to ruin my marriage. It completely robs you of that ability to have a true and healthy relationship with another individual. It didn't take long for me to start to feel like David was not talking to me anymore. I think there's a lot of red flags, but when we're not educated about it, we don't really look for him. I didn't realize what was happening. I had no clue, no idea that there was an addiction present in my marriage. I started in that relationship with really high levels of self-esteem, self-worth, and I left completely hollowed out. All of a sudden, my eyes opened to what? damage it did and what consequences my choices had. That was the first time that I had really come to grips with how big of a problem this was. My whole mentality about what pornography was and what it meant, I think was very shame-based. There was probably so much shame in him, he would push people away. Shame contributes to that feeling that I can't talk about this issue with anyone else. Shame doesn't like to be exposed. Shame doesn't want to be seen. I wasn't ready to say, you know, I have a problem and it's okay to admit to that. Where that becomes an unhealthy shame is when uh, people go beyond saying, I don't like what I've done to I don't like who I've become. That's the reality of it. You're afraid to, to let anyone know who you are. The final obstacle to true Christian community is the inability to be sinners together. Paul said, if you had shared with me that you were human and that you made mistakes, it would have been easier for me to, to come to you. But I always thought you were perfect and I didn't want to, you know, let you down. What we're wanting to do is try to reduce some of the toxic shame that's associated with their behavior. There's a lot of judgment and condemnation in society and they probably always will be. What Jesus wanted to teach us is that it ought not to come from us because it's not coming from him. We have to learn how to break out of that shame cycle. The way to do that is to help someone get back to their sense of worth as an individual. The more realistic we can be that we all struggle, that we all don't want to be seen that way, but when we talk about it, it gives people permission to come forward. It's not where you're at, it's the direction you're going. The only way to be healed is to be seen. Then the healing begins. I decided I've got to tell my wife. I knew at that point I was gonna tell her. I didn't know how or when, but the weirdest thing is it was the hardest thing I've ever done, but it's the best thing I've ever done. I, I, had, I had prayed for that moment my whole life. As much as I didn't want to tell my husband and I didn't want to tell other people, it's like part of that chain just broke off of me. And it was in those moments, just as I made that confession, that the real burden of the secret was lifted. Recovery is a process, it's a lifestyle change. With that process, there's time involved, there's tremendous effort involved, and there's gonna be bad days, there's gonna be days then when, you know what, is this really worth it? And the answer has to be yes. I didn't even understand how much of a journey it was gonna be and how damaged I was. I was committed to recovery and three years later, almost exactly, I fell back into the behavior. That is traumatic. It was even harder to tell him because I just felt, how could he forgive me again? It was hard enough the first time, and what's wrong with me that I can't stop doing this? I bought into that lie of thinking that I'm not healed, that I'm never going to be set free. That's a very natural thing to feel like there's no way out. I can't believe I'm doing this again. Mess-ups are part of the recovery process. You want to let your 
bottom line be a little higher each time. It's about perfectly understanding our weaknesses and being perfect about coming back to Christ and letting Him take that. There has to be a willingness to let go and let God help. And at the moment that I made that thought, that is when God reached out to me again. And what it was was the choice to finally live a spiritual life. His forgiveness is more than just freeing us from something, it's healing us and it's restoring us. God spoke to my spirit and said, it's all right, I love you, that's all that matters. The biggest part was understanding love again, understanding what real love was, how much God loves me, and then being able to love other people like that. One day at a time, miracles have not ceased. It's sad that not a whole lot of people talk about it, or at least it's hard to find <laughs> the people who are talking about it. It's not comfortable for people to talk about, but we have to talk about it. Teaching yourself, teaching your spouse, teaching your children, most importantly, what it is, is the most important thing, I think, that you can do. It's our responsibility as parents to prepare them for messages in the culture that can be harmful or confusing or downright false. As we bridle and channel desires, that really enables us to live more passionately and more fully. Really has to come down to understanding the issue as a society to then help those that are struggling. There's something in it that kept me from, from having a whole life. And by whole, I mean just experiencing things to a depth that it's like rewarding and fulfilling, you know? And now it's, it's like that. I had no idea that it could be like this, and I just wish I could take that out of my heart and give it to someone so they know how much hope is out there because there is so much hope on the other side. And so when you watch that and you were able to see people who are now willing to step forward and speak about the pain in their lives. I'm so very proud of my husband for going public and, and sharing his story. And more and more people are willing to do that, especially those who've gone through the Reclaim Sexual Health program and have found that healing. And they're now wanting to speak out and bring others uh, to that healing. And one of the pieces is that the culture has always said, once an addict, always an addict. And how we were saying by those words that, that God did not have the healing power. And so again, what do we need to do as a faith community but claim that healing power of Christ and help those who are struggling to find that healing. And so to understand how you go about that, to under, you need to first understand what has happened to someone who's caught up. And so Bruce is going to share that. And even before I start sharing what happened, I have to tell you that I am so proud of my wife. Because without her help, without her support, without her standing behind me, we wouldn't be here sharing this story with you today. I wouldn't have had a job, I wouldn't have had a family, and I wouldn't have had the beautiful grandchildren that we now have being born back in the United States. So thank you, honey. Okay. What is it really going on when a person gets hooked on pornography? This is what we want to talk a little bit about what happens in your brain and in your head. Oh. <laughs> okay. The first step that usually takes is like what happened to me, curiosity. Okay, I see this. What is this? What's going on? And that curiosity sticks with you long enough to make you take a second look and perhaps a third look. And at that point, it becomes entertainment now. It's like, well, when, when I'm kind of bored and I don't know what's going on, I don't know what to do, I'm going to go back to that because I remember when I did that, it had this pull, it had this draw to me. Then it becomes, at some point, self-medication because you go into a mode quite frequently of masturbation, and at that point, you're saying, you know what, I feel better. After I look at porn and after I masturbate, I get this kind of temporary relief from all the problems that have been going on in my life. And then it becomes a compulsion because now you say, every time I feel a little crazy or a little bit stressed or whatever, i got to go to the porn. That's what helped me last time. And then it goes eventually to a dependency where, you know, I know that the only way I'm going to feel better is if I start working with this pornography. That's my out, that's my medication that I take on a regular basis. And if you follow that pattern long enough, it will become addiction. 
And when it's an addiction, that means you get up in the morning, the first thing on your mind is the porn. You go to bed at night, the last thing on your mind, oh, I need this to go to sleep. If I watch the porn and masturbate, I'll get to sleep better tonight. And you become, you, no longer in your brain, you're no longer thinking about it anymore. It's totally subconscious, but in order to live, you're counting on this unhealthy sexual behavior. So we want to talk a little bit about, okay, what is it in this brain? Where's this brain science that's going on here? So we all have a limbic system. Limbic system is a part of our brain that's connected to motivation. God gave us this wonderful plan. He wanted us to be motivated individuals. He wanted us to have joy, enjoy life. He wanted us to, you know, eventually find a spouse, raise a family. And of course, he wanted us to survive on a daily basis. So look for important things like food and water so we stay alive, and then shelter, and then to share that and become relational with other people. So the brain's kind of laid out in three basic functional layers. The reptilian brain, that's the basics, that's the function, that's, okay, my heart's here, I don't have to stop and think about it every time I take a breath, it takes care of the mechanical stuff. The limbic brain, like I said, is part of where God plugs in some of this motivational stuff in life to keep us going. And then the cortex, that's that beautiful part of the brain where we develop responsibility, we develop full understanding, we develop morality, and we develop a sense of what's right and wrong. So within the system, um, we have a couple of different spots that function this, this upper portion of the brain picture that looks kind of like a, a worm-shaped thing. That's the whole connecting part we call the cingulate gyrus. What that does, that, that's a mediator that connects the limbic part of the brain over to the frontal cortex. Now, if everything's working well, there's a signal that gets kind of filtered through into the frontal cortex and then comes back again with good reason and good judgment back into that pleasure system so that when the pleasure is being perceived, we're perceiving it for healthy reasons. Unfortunately, we bypass that frontal cortex, uh, you'll see as we start to get more and more in-depth into the process of addiction. And unfortunately for young people, that prefrontal cortex doesn't get all of its wiring and all of its connections completed until we reach at least our early 20s and for many people their middle 20s. So our young people are at a disadvantage already because the wires aren't even fully connected for them to responsibly think about what it is that they're being called to do or what the motivation is about and what's giving them joy in life. So this gives you another look at it. Um, we also have the temporal lobes shown on here because what we're finding also is in the temporal lobes resides anger and aggression. And we're finding a lot more anger and aggression being tied into behavior with pornography and with pornographic addictions, because as Jeannie mentioned earlier, there are websites that are mixing the nudity along with violence, and that starts to trigger the portions of our brain that are violence and attack and you know, aggression-oriented. We found out with people even that have temporal lobe injuries that what happens is that they become an kind of antisocial and more aggressive against people, so we know that there's an effect there. Um, within our brain, we have this little thing in the middle, like, like an almond, it's called the amygdala. That is our, our receiver, that's our, our sender of information. If you have a gut feeling, uh, an emotion of some kind, the amygdala is what pushes out the alarm and it says, I'm feeling something, something's going on here. And so it'll send that message out to a place in your body, in your brain, where dopamine is produced. It's an area called a VTA, ventral tegmental area, and it shoots out this dopamine. Dopamine is the motivating chemical, okay? I'm feeling something, now I'm motivated to take action and do something with it. And then that, once that's registered, then uh, the insula is the portion of the brain that actually kind of provides the joy in a normal, healthy brain, as God designed it. The joy is what's cranked out of that insula area once we've gone through that motivation cycle. And this gives you kind of another way of looking at it, a way of looking at it in a 3D view because people looking at flat brains is kind of looking like a flat map of the world. You don't get the full picture of where things are residing, what's going on. Okay, one of the interesting things about the brain, as we mentioned, is this whole wiring thing. Young brains are very, very open. They've got tons of circuits ready to be wired into place. And that's because they have a lot of things to learn and a lot of behaviors to learn into life as they take their first steps as children and whatever else. And so God gave them many, many more circuits to play with in order to wire in behaviors. As they start to get a little older, some of those circuits that aren't being used eventually start to die off because of lack of use, and those circuits they are using get more and more hardwired. 
Well, then what happens as you develop more fully into a, an adult stage, or at least into the pre-adult stage, is that you now have kind of developed some patterns pretty strongly in your life, and so those wires grow even more strongly, and more of the wires that you haven't used uh, become let loose or become released. So what's so dangerous about this is that if your behaviors are unhealthy early on in life, you have many different ways that you can wire those unhealthy behaviors in, and what they will do then, if you do them over and over again, is they will become the dominant wires. And the older you get, the harder it is for you to unlearn and to change those behaviors on your own because you've just, you've just plunked them right in there and, and hardwired them. So, <coughs> excuse me. This again shows you the, the areas in the brain that are part of this motivational system. Now, children young, and young adults have higher levels of dopamine automatically than adults do. And there's a reason for this. God, again, put motivation in here. Children, as they're growing up, are supposed to have the courage to take the first steps to try to learn how to walk. They're supposed to have motivation to start choosing foods that they like. You know, mom and dad say, do you want cereal or do you want a banana? Those kinds of things. We start to build them into a in more independent behavior. So God gave them more of the motivating chemicals so that they don't just sit back and, and wait for things to happen, but they start to pursue things. And then they eventually pursue relationships and behaviors. So God wanted it to get them out get them moving. Get them out of the house. Get them outside to play. Get them away from the Xbox. Um, all the different kinds of motivations that young people need as they learn to be independent are all built in and hardwired into us. However, when that system gets hijacked, when they start to learn certain behaviors and that's all that they use those motivational chemicals for, what they do is they sidetrack the ability to motivate in the proper areas. So when people talk about, you know, they got a 30, 40 year old kid that's still attached to mom's ap apron strings and can't go away, we're starting to see and believe that part of that is due to the fact that the motivating behaviors that would have caused them to differentiate and become separate standalone adults were hijacked, all those chemicals were motivating them instead, running back and forth through this pleasure cycle with their behaviors, their unhealthy sexual behaviors. Now, communication, and then we'll talk just a little bit about how that works. In our form, we're communicating right now primarily by sound and sight. So if I talk, you have your ears, you listen. If you talk and ask me a question, I have my ears, I listen. Very simple wiring system that actually is pretty complicated underneath the radar and behind the screen. So how do brain cells communicate? How does all these messages get sent around inside of you? Well, we have these things called the neurons, the brain cells. There's two ends on them. One end is the pickup or the receiving end. The other end is the end that transmits on to the next level. And in that transmitter end, we come across an area called a synapse. A synapse is a gap before the next receiving area begins. So it's like my voice travels across space before it gets to your ears. The message in your body goes through little chemicals called neurotransmitters to come off of one nerve cell and become connected and received and perceived by the adjoining nerve cell. And this is the area where the dopamines and some of these chemicals we're going to be mentioning, this is where it functions. It functions in those gaps between the, the nerve cells. So a real quick e example how this happens. Uh, when I was fifth grade, I was unfortunate enough to have my hand in the hinge side of a door when someone slammed it. And uh, not only did they slam it and I experienced pain, but since the door was shut, I was stuck. So immediately a pain message went from my finger up to my, all the way up my spinal cord into my brain to the pain center saying, ouch, that hurts. Then my brain sends a message all the way back down my spinal cord out to my arm saying, well then pull your hand out of there, right? But guess what? I can't because the door is shut. So another message goes back all the way up through my spinal cord into my brain saying, can't move his hand. So then it becomes auditory. Help! Somebody let me out of here. And then somebody opens the door and on, at that point, I now was free to take the trip to the hospital to have the end of my finger reattached because it actually was severed while it was pinched in that door. Talk about pain, but think of all, how quickly all of that could happen and be wired through our body. So the brain has a reward pathway that functions with neurons sending messages back and forth all the time also. We have, as we mentioned before, uh, the VTA where the dopamine is produced. The NA, the nucleus accumbens, is the place where it goes to, and then from there, the message is sent out, okay, what are we supposed to do next? What, what do we do with the motivation? Now, notice at the front of this, we have that prefrontal cortex. That's where we're supposed to be filtering the message. Okay, I've got this motivation. I'm supposed to do something, but what am I supposed to do? Well, let's see. What does the Ten Commandments say? What does my Catholic faith say? What do all the other things I've learned in life say? And if that's wired in, we will get a choice to produce some kind of a healthy behavior when we go out and resolve the dopamine. 
However, what if it is that our prefrontal cortex isn't wired in yet because we're young? Then we don't have the ability to have that extra filter. So we'll just go as far as a dopamine says, I need pleasure. Oh, I found this. This is pleasurable, whether it's a pornography or the unhealthy behavior. And it's resolved right then and there. And we never even think at the level of, am I sinning? Am I doing things that are wrong? It becomes a habit that becomes basically amoral as well as immoral. Well, what are the other chemicals that are involved besides that dopamine? We have something called norepinephrine, which is an adrenaline-based chemical that gives us the energy to pursue what we're motivated to do. So that gets us, gets the heart rate up, gets us going, so that we take the action that we're motivated to take. Also, what it does, which is an un, one that people don't talk about a lot, is that it's a memory chemical. Whatever you are doing when you get a burst of norepinephrine in your brain will be remembered forever. The sights, the sounds. Now, God's plan, the very first time that you meet your future spouse, you, fall in, you remember the song you were dancing to, or you remember the picnic you had, the restaurant you ate at. All those things are part of your permanent memory, part of your record that you have together as a couple. God wanted it to be that way. But what if what you remember is porn? What if you're going up to receive the Holy Eucharist at church, and all of a sudden, in your image, in your mind, flashes a porn picture? It's totally out of control at that point, and you have no way of stopping it without practicing a whole lot of brain behavior, which is part of what we're going to be talking about here. And then lastly, the serotonin. Serotonin is why some people have to take Prozac. It helps calm the system down. It's the resolution of this drive and this energy that actually lets you experience the platitude and the joy and the you know, solitude and excitement of what happens when you resolve these cravings that your body kicks out towards you. So what we're talking about here is the difference between righteous, translated right use, of our motivational and our chemical system, or wrong use, a use where the system is basically very self-dependent and very self-oriented. How do I resolve my dopamine cravings in my own way by myself? So how does a progression of addiction take place? It starts with that curiosity we mentioned before. It then will eventually become the compulsion, where you start to do it more often because it felt like it was right. Then the dependency, I have to do this in order to resolve these emotions or whatever feelings I have. And then finally, do it often enough, it becomes the addiction. Now you're no longer even filtering or thinking about it. Now, if you're having a bad day or if you just want to have a day at all, you're going after your unhealthy behavior. Well, how do we know all this? Is this all just stuff that we're, we're dreaming up? No. Now that we have brain imaging, which is, you know, recent medical history, brain imaging is showing us the active areas of the brain that happen when these different events occur. And so we can pinpoint, where is that dopamine? Where is it coming from? And where is it going? And what is it doing along the way? We can trace the wiring circuits. So a series of slices through the brain when they're done in a functional MRI or whatever. And the process of high in the first place, how do people get this high feeling, supposedly, that resolves their, their, their feelings of guilt or whatever. What happens is the dopamine, the body, again, God put in our body a thermostat. If you continue to dose with more and more and more adrenaline and more and more and more dopamine, your body will burn out. Your circuits won't be able to handle it. You'll have heart, your heart will die. All kinds of crazy things will happen physiologically. So God put in a thermostat. If you're starting to produce too much dopamine, God knows you can't have a whole lot of adrenaline. So what he does is the system is built to slow down the dopamine receptors so that not as much dopamine gets transferred to the next level to cause the production of the adrenaline. But you're bringing that dopamine out in massive doses because you have created this behavior, this unhealthy sexual behavior, porn, whatever it is. And so what's going to happen is all of that dopamine is just going to sit there and build up. And when it builds up, what it does is it creates the craving. So when we talk about addicts, someone who's, I got to have the next cigarette, I got to have my next drink, or I got to have my next dose of pornography, that craving comes from all of this unresolved dopamine that can't follow the proper channel to give you the adrenalines and then the serotonin to calm your life down. So how do we know where the dopamine goes in your brain? We do scans. On this, on this slide, on the right-hand side of the slide as you see it, excuse me, the left-hand side of the slide as you see it, the orange areas that look like a thunderstorm on the weather radar, those are the areas where the dopamine is being received in the brain. If you look at the right-hand side of your screen, where it looks like the storm is over and it's just kind of raining a little bit, those are the brains of the addict where the dopamine receptors have been literally shut down so that we don't get that overdose we were just talking about. But now we show a brain that's craving. 
even in the individual nerve cells themselves. On the top part of the screen, you see all the really heavy projected fingers coming out. What happens is the brain cell produces, kind of like a plant looking for roots, or putting down roots to find more water, the brain cells put out more axons, more connections, in order to wire themselves in for communication. The longer you use them, the thicker and heavier they grow, and the more connected. What they do is they start recruiting. They say, this, this circuit here, I don't have enough electricity flowing through here to get the high that I really need, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug some more wires in so that I'm sure that that message goes all the way through my body. Look at the normal one, the lower right-hand side of the screen, a normal, normal number of axons, normal number of connections, thinner wiring, because that wiring is more diverse. It's not dedicated to just one behavior. <coughs> so this is just a, kind of a, a look at actually our physiologically being able to see, to dissect and see what's going on in the brain of an addict. Now, a healthy brain, surface brain scan, all the pretty colors. And by the way, the front part of your brain is the top of the slide. What happens here is you see good blood flow, you see good resolution, good color temperature, because the brain is functioning healthily and normally. Look what happens when we take an addicted brain. In Wisconsin, we call that a cheese head. It's, it's, it's like Swiss cheese. What you see is you see um, a bunch of openings in the brain that they're really not holes, but what they are is they're areas of inactivity. Those are areas where the blood flow is no longer proper, the chemistry is no longer proper. And so notice where the most of the holes are in that frontal cortex because it's not just that if you don't have a frontal cortex you have problems, it's that if you are adult and you have a frontal cortex and you grow up, you still have problems once you start this addictive behavior because the brain chemistry, the dopamine and the epinephrine start to destroy that part of your brain. One of the beauties though is that we have scientists who are beginning to recognize the power of meditation. And in our home state, state of Wisconsin, uh, they're doing a lot of studies there. And one of the things they've discovered is that the rosary is one of the best forms of meditation to bring blood flow back into those places. <coughs> so in the child, the adolescent, the adults, the brains are still developing. We kind of covered that pretty well, so we can just kind of move on with this one. Um, again, this is just another, this is a, a colored picture, colored picture showing you the same things, showing you the development of the brain. And again, what I said, what's, what's so serious about the addiction is that as the individual ages, those, it becomes less and less likely that they're going to be able to channel their behaviors off in new directions. The directions have been set, the path has been set, the channels have been cut, and the wiring is there. So, teenage boys are the ones that are really extremely vulnerable. First of all, male brains in general are more visually oriented. Teenagers have got uh, just an unbelievable sense of, of attuneness, and they've got all that dopamine motivating them, so away they go. Um, the other thing is that um, because they're more visually oriented, they're also more sexually oriented because men wear their genitals on the external part of their body, and so it's, it's more it's more feelable, more palpable to them that there are changes going on. So here's one that Jeannie, uh, how are you doing? No? Okay, Jeannie explains this very well, but um, what happens is that we found with studies that ejaculation patterns, once they begin, are very, very quickly hardwired. So if a, if a masturbation pattern is started, a young adult or a teenager will start their psychosocial development at a very early, a very early age, and within 36 months, of the first time that they masturbate and ejaculate, the pattern of arousal and behavior for them has been set. The wiring is laid in place. And so the arousal template now becomes masturbation rather than um, you know, God's plan for what's going to happen to him as an adult. Okay, so the porn market knows this. You know, scientists don't work just on one side of the issue here. They've got their own scientists that do these brain studies and work on it. So they know the effect of addiction, and they know how to lure people into pornography. And because of those young brains, the 12 to 17-year-olds, it's not only that they're the highest users on the market just by, by age, it's also that they're the ones that are being targeted the most because they know where to sell that stuff the best. So as we look at this, one of the things that we're discovering is happening is that the typical desire, say, of the male to go out and find that, that partner 
it isn't existing anymore because their arousal pattern has been set and it's not for a real live person in front of them anymore. So they don't even desire it. And the sad part is the more involved they are at a younger age, sometimes it's that they can't even achieve a relationship if they would even begin one. And so this is very dangerous. And we have to look at that it's like giving crack cocaine to a baby when you give pornography to a teenage boy and you just know addiction is going to be pretty much almost guaranteed with that kind of process. So no wonder, as Bruce said, that's the target. And also these young men have 20 times the amount of testosterone bursting through their bodies, and that's the sex drive hormone. So that creates more and more desire, more and more r unresolved dopamine going through their bodies. So they're just, it's the perfect storm, if, you, if they could call this perfect, for them. So... It'd be like if you gave crack cocaine to a baby and then expected as the baby grew up to an adult, they would just wean themselves off of it. So these teens, they're getting all the drugs they need in the comfort of their own home, their cell phone, their computer, and their bedroom or whatever else. Uh, it's all right there for them. Um, but what it's being given is fantasy and filth and gore, as we mentioned, and sexuality presented in a way that is not at all according to the way God intended us to have it presented. And then their self-medication comes literally from inside. They medicate themselves from the inside. Their drugs are their own drugs from internally. So when you get trapped in this world of puberty and you're trapped in this behavior, you're pretty much becoming addicted and addicted perhaps for life. Part of what we're finding then is that this does trap, especially the male, into puberty. And so you hear women who are saying, my husband's my fifth child. You see TV shows and movies where they're always making that the guy's just too dumb to do anything. Um, and so when you look at the whole change in our culture because of the use of pornography, that the God-given right for male to be head of household, to be head of family, is no longer even possible if they have been involved and trapped in this puberty position for so long. So here we have obscene profits from the pornography industry and clients that literally are you know, self-created and your clients forever. So every thought we have, no matter what thought we think about, is a biochemical event. And so it's what that biochemistry does that we work with in all of this. So pornogra pornography does cause biological effects in the body, and it does open up this whole pharmacy within us of internal chemicals. So like we have said, it produces drugs of its own in the brain. And by the way, these dopamines and things like that, if you go on the street corner and you buy cocaine and you take cocaine, it's not the cocaine that's getting you high. It's this chemical process that we're talking about. It's the resolution of the dopamine and whatever that's actually causing the high. So it's cheap. It's readily available. And, and even at a very young age. And then pornographic imagery is perceived as reality. And this is another thing that's uh, another new thing about internet pornography that's so insidious is we also have in our brain a portion call, or some neurons that are dedicated to what we call mirror neurons. They are the ones that immerse you into a behavior. You know, a real simple example, you're sitting at a table with a few people, somebody yawns, and all of a sudden everybody's yawning. And it's not necessarily, it's just an automatic response because it's, when they studied it in the primate community, they called it the monkey see, monkey do neuron because they mimicked each other. Well, imagine now that you're watching a pornographic video, you're seeing action, or you're interacting because it's being webcast and, and you're interacting you know, vocally and physically. What happens is you immerse yourself exactly into that position. You become the actor. You are swearing that you are part of that scene. And that's what's so insidious about taking it to full motion and taking it to dialogue and whatever, is that you now become a pornographic actor yourself and you believe that you have relationships with these people that you're watching. So the chemicals that are involved in some of this, they, they fit the patterns of what we call attraction, which God gave us attracting chemicals because he wanted us to pursue a relationship and have a marriage. They're infatuation because we now can zero in so much on one relationship that the rest of the world seems to go away. That's when that norepinephrine comes in and starts us bonding more closely. And then commitment uh, along comes a set of chemicals we'll be talking about in a minute, like oxytocin and vasopressin. 
So we have this cocktail of love or lust because the chemi chemistry in the brain is the same, just depends on what you're using it for. We already mentioned estrogen and testosterone, those are the sex drive chemicals. Um, we talked about the dopamine, that gives us the pleasure, also gives us the motivation. We have the epinephrine, that is the adrenaline that makes us move. We have phenylethylamine, which is an excitement and happiness and euphoric type of medication or drug within our body, especially when we are in new love. And then the serotonin, the natural antidepressants that happen after we've experienced a relationship with, with our wife. And, then, and, and that can be, by the way, and then oxytocin, excuse me, oxytocin is a bonding chemical. It can be bonding between mother and child. It can also be bonding between husband and wife. As soon as you start to touch physically, and especially if you, you know, enter into the marital embrace and have intercourse, large bursts of oxytocin are released be between you. Every time the oxytocin is released, the bond between the two people gets stronger and stronger. And then we have um, the vasopressin, which is on the male side of the body. It's the commitment chemical. It's okay. I now have a wife. We may have a child. I am dedicated. I will stand tall and protect my wife and my family, and um, I will be the man that God wants me to be. Now, an interesting thing about this, again, in, in new brain chemistry that we've studied, oxytocin, well, first of all, oxytocin begins within 20 seconds when you are hugging, your, hugging and having physical touch. So you go into the, the young adult community and the adolescent community and they have these things they call cuddle buddies or friends with privileges. Just think of how these young people, it only takes 20 seconds of skin-to-skin -skin contact and they're already bonding to each other. And then we wonder why relationships are having the kinds of difficulties and issues they are. What also has been shown is that the only true source, especially for a man, of the oxytocin bonding comes from intercourse with a spouse or a real person, let's say, just to say intercourse with a real person. If a man masturbates, he does not get the same release of oxytocin. And what happens then is he has the unresolved ability to bond. And so every time he masturbates, he has a hole in his heart, and what he does is he goes back to trying to seek more chemistry to resolve that hole in his heart. Vasopressin, though, that's there. The vasopressin comes regardless of how the ej ejaculation occurs, and this is what's scary, too, because with the young man, what can happen is now he becomes bonded to the computer, bonded to the pornography, bonded to himself, because he's literally making love to himself. And so when they develop a secret life, there's my life here as a student or as a churchgoer or whatever I am, then there's my life over here where I use porn, they can keep them very separate because they will draw, they'll build a wall to protect their addictive behaviors be based on that vasopressin they're releasing. So looking at it as a kind of a process real quickly, narrowing it down, when, when a husband and wife come together in a funnel, we call a funnel of love, these first chemicals, the dopamine and whatever, cause them to start to turn towards each other and to, to, to become more intimate with each other. And as that process continues and then the other chemistry comes in, the norepinephrine or whatever, they focus in so closely on each other that the rest of the world kind of goes away at that moment in time, and when they narrow the focus completely and they go through the marital embrace and have intercourse, they now get those blasts of oxytocin and serotonin that bond them and then relax them. And then after that point, when they start to move back out of the funnel at the bottom and back out into the world, they now are partners for life, 38 years now. They are committed to taking on the world together, so they travel to Canada and share this information with people as a team, and all is well with the world at this point because they now have a new mission. However, if we do the funnel of lust, we do the same chemistry, but now there's only one person going into the funnel. And when that one person zeroes in, they begin to zero in on the images of the pornography. They zero in on themselves. As we mentioned, when the oxytocin is supposed to release that climax, they don't get the big burst of oxytocin, but if it's a male, they do get the big burst of vasopressin. And now, when they come back out in the world, who's their teammate? Me, myself, and I. So when we talk about people having narcissistic tendencies, they are themselves and they are the whole world, this is where some of that is coming from. And secondly, they come out and now they're ashamed. My goodness, what have I done? I can't believe I did that again. I said, you know, I went to confession two weeks ago. I told Father I was never going to do this again, and here I am, I did it again. So you come out with a sense of shame. Shame creates pain. Pain creates a need for chemistry, and where does the chemistry come from? Back up to the top of the funnel, and we go right back through the cycle again. 
Now, it's really key to know that these things that are happening in our pleasure system throughout our body, these were designed by God, and he designed it so that these images of our spouse would be burned into our brains and to really understand that the first time we were supposed to see the naked image of the opposite sex was to be on our wedding night and that we would become addicted to our spouse in a very holy and healthy way. But when it's these other images, of course, we know the danger and what's happening. But even more than that is the attitude, like Bruce said, this narcissistic approach that starts to be me, 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 that starts happening within that that porn is creating. And so God created that human sexuality, the human sexual union, was going to be unselfish, self-donating, and between the husband and wife. Well, if we look at what pornography is doing, it's not unselfish and it's not self-donating. In fact, it's not even really about two persons because you see the one person who is using the other person to obtain their own sexual gratification. So again, it's not about loving, it's about using. And it creates this using mentality around human sexuality. And we have that as a culture, not even as individuals anymore, because it's so prolific in our societies. So women are not looked at as they are made in the image and likeness of God with their own dignity and desires and needs. They're things to be used. And this is the simply the means to their sexual satisfaction. But what we find, as Bruce said earlier, is the sexual conditioning. If young people are starting into this process, process so early, it becomes a real need for them to have that particular type of stimulation. So in other words, when a guy gets started on one form of his sexual arousal pattern, that's the one he's going to stick to, and he will lose his ability for self-donating love and self-expression of care for another person. So it's all about using at that point, which we know is not going to work in a marriage, which is part of why it leads to those divorces. Wives feel used because they're being used. And as we begin to look deeper at that, we see, you know, some of the beautiful teachings of Pope John Paul II, which have been summed up with Christ assigns the dignity of every woman as a task to every man. And we have now destroyed that in our culture, that that's not what's focused on. Then to see the complete destruction where porn is said to be ruining the sexual lives of an entire generation. Because we're finding so many couples today that when they get married, they are not able to consummate that marriage. Because the male is unable to maintain an erection and sometimes even unable to get an erection with a real woman. He has conditioned himself to masturbating with his hand. And so even if he has the erection, he's unable to ejaculate within his wife. And this is a common problem that we're hearing more and more about. So in premarital classes, we're going to need to point this out because within the Catholic Church, if you can't consummate a marriage, it's not going to be a sacramental marriage. So we need to look at that. And there's more and more studies showing this, but we can also just look at the number of ads there are for all the erectile dysfunction medication. Do we really think that that's that many senior men using this? No, it's being used by men in their 20s. Some of them are even using it at this point in order to masturbate. So it's really grown as an issue, and we're seeing so many wives who just knew brides, and they, they can't understand what's going on. And Well, they thought they married a man who had saved himself because, yes, he maybe never had relations with another woman, but he continued to have them with himself. Now, some of what's going on here is the complete changed environment. Now, many years ago, we took our children down to South Carolina and the States, and the stairways to these big mansions, there were two stairs coming from either side instead of the center. And the tour guide explained one was for men, one was for women, because the women wore those long dresses. And they would have to hike up their skirts a little bit in order to go up the steps. And if a man saw a woman's ankles, he was sexually aroused. So they had him use the other steps. I want to ask you, how many men today are going to be sexually aroused by seeing ankles? Because as the bottom picture in our, our show shows here, you have these young boys already who are seeing complete nudity in women. And so we have desensitized our culture to all of these types of arousal patterns in general. I also had a, a priest who was talking to us after one of our presentations, and he said, I have watched the decrease in confessions talking about fornication, you know, sexual relations outside of marriage. He said, because I, I guess they're only masturbating now. And this is what has become known as safe sex today, where people are engaging in video cam of each other when they're even dating, and then they're masturbating with themselves looking at the image of their 
person that they're dating. We see books that are out there all about, you know, many books about the tools of self-pleasuring. In the States, our generally our, our little family kind of drugstore has always been Walgreens. If you go into any Walgreens now in America, you're going to see right next to the sanitary pads for women who are menstruating will be a huge display of all the self-pleasuring tools and vibrators, et cetera, for women. It's become that mainstream that even the family corner drugstore is openly selling these types of, of information. Now, what's really going on, though? Okay, this is an interesting study that was done with animals. Um, they took a male rat, a female rat that was in heat, put them together in a cage and let them breed. Now, after the breeding, there's a refractory time for men before they can have intercourse again. And what they did was they found out that at, after each successive mating, the refractory period became longer. However, when they switched up the rules, this time, whatever the, what they did is after a mating, they dropped a brand new female that was in heat in the cage with the same male. And what they found out was the refractory period went way, way down. You see the little graph we've got here. Um, the top graph where it's the, the time is getting longer and longer, that's same male, same female over and over again, longer and longer time span between mating. Look what happens almost flat line with his sexual performance when he has new mates every time. And this is all based on what the brain dis discovers as novelty. Novelty is a great producer, a large producer of dopamine, and dopamine again gets this whole cycle started and gets it going. And so eventually what they found is that these rats would just keep mating until they were eventually exhausted. When we have showed or talked on this uh, to large groups, and there's, a, you know, women will say and often after us, that looked just like my husband, the couch potato. And again, the mentality of men now of being lazy and just uh, because many of them have literally exhausted themselves staying up all night with the novelty of one more click, one more click, one more click in multiple masturbation acts. Now there's something called the Coolidge effect, and we tend to know a little bit too much about President Coolidge and his, his wife and their relationship, that they were touring a farm once, as the story goes, and they were touring separately. And Mrs. Coolidge saw how this rooster was continually mating, and she said, does that happen all the time? And they said, oh, yes. She said, make sure you point that out to President Coolidge when he comes around. And so when President Coolidge came there, they said, Mrs. Coolidge wanted us to point out to you how this rooster is continually mating. And he looked and he said, I have one question. Is it always the same hen? And they said, oh, no, it's always different hens. He said, tell that to Mrs. Coolidge. So it became known as the Coolidge effect of the novelty. And this is what creates this automatic response to novel mates, more, more, more. It's also what is at the foundation of why some people get into a habit of one night stands, be maybe the habit of, of what they call addicted to love. You like that new burst of energy for the new relationship, but after a short time, you start to lose those chemicals and you're no longer are interested in that person because you want that fresh new feeling. And so we look at that and to see how the dopamine levels are almost the same with the second rat as the first rat. And to understand, again, we are, we're, we're not saying we're rats, but there are similar behaviors because we all have these limbic systems that are shared by all mammals. But God gave us as humans that more rational cerebral cortex, so we're not supposed to be living out of that base limbic system, but too often pornography triggers us into that. So really it's an addiction to novel pixels. And when I work with wives whose husbands are addicted to pornography and they're thinking maybe I wasn't pretty enough, maybe I wasn't, and they're all worried about that, to be able to say it's the novelty that they're attracted to. And, and to really help to separate that can help the wife to be able to, to heal her own wounds. To really understand much more in depth some of the things Bruce was able to shortly share tonight with you on this information. And to really realize that the strongest natural blast of dopamine available is sexual stimulation and orgasm. And the greatest sense of peace will come if that's with your spouse. If not, you're doing, as Bruce said, expanding that craving. So a question I'd have for you, just kind of a simple thing, if I could offer you right now a plate with some neat chocolate cake on it or celery, which one do you crave? Which one would you prefer? I would presume it's going to be the chocolate cake. Why? Because you get a lot more dopamine eating chocolate than you do eating celery. Not so much in with celery. So we really look at the change that occurs within our own desires for something like that. And to see the ex extreme, and again, I'm not saying we're monkeys, but to look at the extreme, that monkeys will actually pay to see female monkey bottoms on a TV screen and give up eating. They'll hand their food away if they have this chance to do this. So that limbic brain system is what's really focusing and promoting this type of behavior 
And so we have that part in our brain that says, go for it regardless of consequences. So when you say, what was he thinking? He wasn't thinking. That's the problem. And again, this image is showing the natural amount of those dopamine receptors that Bruce said compared to the decreased number once you move into that addiction cycle. And again, seeing this declining dopamine receptors that lead us into addiction. That is the foundational effort for addiction. So again, we're just seeing that what the internet does is for the first time we have an unlimited number of potential new novelties by going click, 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 multiple screens, whatever it might be, to find the next piece. And all the four reasons behind that is that primarily it's accessible and that there's such differences in imagery than there was in, say, a Playboy magazine. And there's more of this hardcore nature that's leading pe people to that and that increased consumption. So to look at the difference very quickly between porn of the past and internet porn, the key is unending novelty. So it's really not about nudity. It's about novelty. So in the past, we were able to look at in how in, in uh, digital world today, a person is involved alone. In the real world, it's courtship. In the digital world, it's that voyeurism. In real world, you're going to have the touching, the connecting. In the digital world, it's just click, click, click. In the real world, it's going to be the experience of being touched. In the digital world, it's just searching for the next image. In the real world, you're involved in the connections of smells along with the touch. Digital world, multiple tabs can be open. Click, click, click. In the real world, it's the pheromones and the things God used to connect us with one another. The constant novelty is available in the digital world, but the emotional connection is not there as it is in the real world. The shock and surprise that you're trying to get within the digital world is very different from what it's like when it's interaction with that committed marital spouse. So there's quite a difference that's occurring in this. So with that, we want to look at what is the difference between the porn traits from pre-internet to now. And all of those that are in red are the ones that are extremely high with dopamine. So we look at it cost money before, and now with internet porn, it's free most of the time. Over 18 before, now any age can do it. Cause time, travel, and even danger. Now it's available 24-7, takes seconds, and you can do it in your home. Before it used to be you were weird if you used pornography. Now we have high school boys saying, if I admit I don't, they think I'm weird. Um, it was limited in the past, now unlimited, limited in the past, unlimited when it comes to the types of porn and the variety, and even the types per session, unlimited now, where before it was, it, you know, you had it very limited. So the novelty again, very limited in the past, unlimited now. How many different things you could do in one time was very unlimited. Now you can keep going. Rarely, if ever, were you searching for something else while you were holding your Playboy magazine. Now you're constantly looking for something else. The violation of expectations. So many people say, I never thought I'd get into looking at same-sex pornography. I never thought I'd move in to child pornography. But now they're doing this all the time. And so this escalation to the extreme didn't happen that often in the past, and now it's almost guaranteed that it's going to eventually get to that. So again, right now we have the internet that's waiting for us. And we even are so bold with this, or Satan has become so bold, that we're even naming some of these superstores the lion's den, and we look at 1 Peter 5 verse 7. Your opponent, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, and he has been devouring. And Internet is really exploiting so much more than just sexual desire. We see the concerns that there are even perhaps with how contraceptive use has affected some of this. And again, I'm not saying we're monkeys, but to look at that limbic brain system that we share and how there was a, a, a monkey named Lionel who had three mates. And he was very loyal to them. They put one of those on hormonal contraceptives, and he stopped relating to her. They put the second one on hormonal contraceptives, and he stopped relating to her. They put the third on hormonal contraceptives, and he stopped relating to her and started to just have indiscriminate sexual relations with any of the other females that were on the island. Then they put all the females on the island on hormonal contraceptives. And what they found is he began to violently rape and masturbate to the point that he hurt himself. They took them all off of the hormonal contraceptives, and he went back to being very faithful to his three mates. 
So you look at that and you wonder, what effect have we had? Especially if the spouse is now on hormonal contraceptives and she's not ovulating, and so she's not giving off that type of sexual energy. But her husband's co-worker isn't on hormonal contraceptives and she's ovulating. And what effect does that have on any forms of desire he starts to build towards her? So there's a lot more for us to figure out on all this. There are many symptoms and there's one cause. You know, that impotency and in the beginning it's not for porn, it's just for real people. And then that masturbation starts to have less and less satisfaction. And then that distress leads to an escalation and searching for more. So that's when the violent images, because those adrenalines, the fight or flight adrenalines can be compounded. And so today there's something that's been labeled as gorgasm, where they're masturbating, having orgasms based on gore along with the nudity. And so these morphine porn tastes that don't match their sexual orientation and severe worsening of social anxiety. Remember where I said Bruce couldn't even function in family gatherings, much, much less societal at that point when he was heavy into this. Then that e growing erectile dysfunction becomes even with extreme porn and you begin to see more and more destruction. So there's spouse pain and parent pain and child pain that goes along when a family is caught up with one of or the other or both of parents who are caught up into this. And there's such a staggering growth in this porn use. And the traditional resources of therapists are not equipped for this new uh, onslaught of what internet technology does. In fact, a uh, 2008 survey of marriage and family therapists said that they were not trained to deal with this type of porn addiction. And re most reported that they had not even received much training at all in this. And so what we've had is people who've known from the church perspective to say this is wrong, so you just need to you know, engage in more willpower and say white knuckling, just don't do it, pray harder. But what happens is as they slip, you run into where they begin to say God wasn't listening to my prayers, and they begin to believe they can never get out of this addiction. And that leads again to that avoidance cycle and they fall right back into it. And that addictive cycle brings that shame. And then they feel like they're doomed and then suicide is on the rise. So we need to look deeper at to what's next. We want to bring you now that we've educated you on this, is we want to bring you where the hope and the help and the healing comes from. So if we look at this, we know prayer is the foundation of that recovery. And so we do need to have that approach in, in the confessional and to be able to have Holy Communion, Eucharistic Adoration, prayers to the Blessed Virgin Mary and the angels and the saints, asking for heavenly intercession, and the usage of the sacramentals. However, we know that there needs to be more and God has provided more. So we have to resolve this recovery confusion that's out there. Again, willpower is not enough. The fear and fighting, that avoidance cycle isn't enough. And the, the chemical addiction, you need more help than just prayer and repentance. And that abstinence is not equal to recovery skills. And so being able to also say that porn addiction is not about sex, remember? And it's not cured by marriage. So what do we need to look at? We have to be able to mend minds, save souls, bless bodies, and heal hearts that are hurt by pornography addiction and other unhealthy sexual behaviors. And that healing is needed not just for the one who's struggling, but also needed for the spouse, children, other relatives, parents, neighbors, friends, and, and ultimately our entire culture that needs the healing from a spiritual, from a mental, and from a physical approach. So the foundation of this program that all these, these brain scientists and therapists and, and all the experts came together to say really upholds our teaching in Romans 12 too. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that you may prove what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. And so they take what we now call the brain science of change and have added and combined that with all the faith practices of the Catholic Church, but specifically teachings about the theology of the body, the right use of sexuality. And many resources have been put together to help individuals, couples, families, parishes, and dioceses to respond to this. But the primary piece that we're looking at is the online program. 
So the Reclaim Sexual Health online program really seeks to serve a worldwide population that are dealing with these issues. It's psychoeducational and cognitive behavioral techniques that have been tested and proven now with over 12,000 people in over 80 countries with great success. It's tailored to individual needs. And so it's a very uh, dynamic technology platform to overcome all of these things. It's private and anonymous. It's online help 24-7. It's the latest in brain science. And there's support for the other people, those spouses and, and clergy can get involved, and the therapists that you may be working with. Cutting edge technology is used in these tools. And we're also able to provide personalized support and accountability with your own personal private coach. And we find that over 97% of those who begin this program have never shared with another human being the activities they're involved in. By the third month, the majority of them have reached out to talk perhaps to their priest in confession or to their spouse. So again, the full spiritual resources of the Catholic program are involved. So again, we're able to look at psychoeducation and recovery training, underlying issues and core causes are addressed, crisis and setback, daily motivation and applications, daily tracking accounts and long-term aftercare is available. Again, the personal program coach is there, faith friends, and a community of support that go along with having an entire um, worldwide forum to provide support to one another. Now, this is for the therapist to understand we're not trying to replace them. This is a tool that they can use. And Dr. Lisa Onken from the National Institute on Drug Abuse has said that the technology that we're using in Reclaim Sexual Health, she believes, is the wave of the future. So that it allows costs to go down in therapists, the limited therapists available, to really be able to reach more people and to use this. So it's just one of the tools that a therapist might want to use and it saves time and focus for them it allows for tracking and follow-up for a therapist and it's something that can be there 24 7 in between sessions and it provides that immediate crisis and setback help it can also work well with a 12-step or group therapy program and it provides the long-term continuing care and the therapist can also use this to reach more people and many people do not need to have a therapist with this because the internet is a lot different than the other print-based had been, that it can also not have underlying causes but just caught up in that technology, which though then causes additional problems for the person so they may need in the future. It's based on some multimedia video training, and these training modules go sequentially to teach them all the steps they need, and in between them are all these exercises that create the brain science of change. And it's very important. First time through, Bruce only did the videos. He didn't do the exercises, no change in behavior. Once he did his homework and did the exercises, he did make the changes in his brain. Um, we're going to just share with you a little bit about what is in one of the modules. And this is the one on explaining some of the church's teachings on healthy sexual behavior. The Catechism of the Catholic Church says, Sexuality affects all aspects of the human person. There's a very important question to ask when it comes to sexual health. Am I expressing God's love through my body? The Bible shows us that intimacy is not meant to be just a preservation of the species, as in the case of animals. Our sexuality is a calling to reflect the image and likeness of God, which is love. God's love is free, total, faithful, and fruitful. Masturbation, fornication, adultery, intentional sterilized sex— Homosexual acts do not image God's free, total, faithful, and fruitful love. In order to understand healthy sexuality, we must learn the true meaning of our bodies as God intended in the beginning. There is so much suffering we could avoid if we only understood God's plan for our bodies. Many people today are genuinely confused about the meaning of life, human relationships, and sexuality. Pope John Paul II responded to this confusion by offering a collection of teachings on the human body and human sexuality, human relationships, marriage and celibacy, or the single life. These teachings are called the theology of the body. It has much to say about human sexuality, but it's fundamentally a teaching on human relationships and how these relationships are a reflection of God's inner life. The theology of the body is much more than a book or a collection of teachings from papal audiences. It's the Catholic vision of what it means to be a human person, 
made in the image and likeness of God. It conveys the ancient truths of the faith in a new, accessible, and relatable way, explaining the relationship between the body and the soul, man and woman, and the human person and God. So you can begin to see that these are the types of modules that we have within this program. So in the program, you're going to learn about God's plan for sexuality. And then also within this program, we have many modules that deal specifically with the brain science behind pornography addiction, some of which Bruce just touched the surface on this information. And then specifically, how do you overcome this masturbation arousal pattern, this masturbation pattern that, that has been established? And to understand sex addiction in all its facets, not just pornography, but if you're involved in any other unhealthy sexual behavior, how this program trains you and teaches you how to change your brain so you can move into the healthy processes that God planned. And so when we look at the life of Jesus and we look at the scriptures and church teaching, in the program as Bruce took it as a secular program, it was all based on this science that was being discovered and on the therapist's perceptions of what was needed. And as we brought together top theologians and, and wonderful scholars in, in the Catholic teaching, we were able to see how beautifully the science and the faith were able to mesh and come together. And one of those we wanted to share with you has to do with an exercise that we teach people that we call Face It, Replace It, Connect. And when we looked at that exercise, we were able to see this is exactly what Jesus did. You know, Jesus was tempted, just like we are tempted by the evil one. But the key was he knew his identity. You know, he'd had those words in, in his time of baptism with John the Baptist. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. So we need people to recognize they are made in the image and likeness of God. And they are a child of God. Not to say, hi, I'm Bruce, I'm a sex addict. No, I'm Bruce, a child of God. And I struggle with sex addiction, a big difference. And so with that knowledge, he was able to face it, replace it, and connect. And so we teach those who are enrolled in this program how that works. And here's the example. One of the greatest examples of confronting and answering your fears is found in the New Testament in Luke chapter 4. Jesus of Nazareth had been fasting in the wilderness for 40 days. He was physically tired, weak, and vulnerable. Of course, this is when the tempter chose to attack him. Jesus, you're hungry and exhausted. Look at that stone over there on the ground. Doesn't it look like a loaf of bread? Give in to your appetite. Use your power to transform the stone and relieve your hunger pains. Confronted with this temptation, one of us would probably close our eyes, grit our teeth, and attempt to force the thought of bread out of our mind. I won't think about bread. I won't. I won't. But Jesus chose a different response, one that was instantly effective 2,000 years ago, and, as the latest brain research and clinical experience show, is just as effective today. Jesus didn't fear, run, or avoid. He faced the temptation head on. Then he took the meaning the tempter wanted the bread-like stone to have, hunger, desire, feeding his appetite, and he replaced it with the higher meaning he wanted to give it. He replaced it with a statement of truth that had very deep and special meaning for him. He said, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Three times Jesus was tempted, and each time he followed the same process. He faced it, and replaced it until the tempter gave up and left him. He then immediately went about his business of teaching, lifting, loving, and connecting with people. To break out of your unhealthy sexual behaviors with pornography and other outlets, follow the same simple process. Face it, replace it, and connect. Here are a few simple examples of how to use this process. I'm at the grocery store checkout counter. I see a magazine cover with a sensual-looking model and sexual title. I have three choices. I can stare at the image and start fantasizing. I can close my eyes, grit my teeth, and start the avoidance battle. Oh, no, I've seen the picture and read the title. Okay, I've got to keep it out of my mind. I won't think about her body. I won't. I won't. And there's a third choice. Face it directly. Yeah, there's another magazine cover. Replace it. 
It's a real shame that women are portrayed as objects. There's so much more to them than a collection of body parts. I really care about women, and I think they deserve to be treated with dignity and respect. I really enjoy seeing women as wonderful, holistic, valuable human beings. Those ridiculous magazine people, they've got it all wrong. Next, I immediately connect with another person. Smiling and looking directly in the eyes of the woman at the checkout stand, I address her by name, the one on her employee badge, and sincerely ask, Hi, Stephanie. How are you doing today? There you have it. Face it, replace it, and connect. There's many exercises where people are going to be doing what we call these FRC replace it, connect practices until it becomes automatic for them. Kind of like if you learn to play a song on the piano and you practice and you practice, you practice till you can actually play that. And so then we look at the next image that we call the stage of the mind. Now all those fancy terms Bruce was sharing about the parts of the brain as they work, we are able to then take those and teach people in a simpler form as though they have what we call the stage of the mind. So there is the director, oops, wrong way, there's the director, the list keep, the responder, the list keeper, and the planner. And so then we go through and we are able to teach them the parts of the brain and how they work by those names that are easier to do. And then we have more modules that are teaching them how to grab a hold of that knowledge and use it to change their lifestyle. And if in charge of them is the responder, that limbic brain system, they're going to have unhealthy sexual behaviors. If it's the director in charge, they're going to have healthy behaviors. So we help them put the director in charge. They have a visualization board within their program that gives them the right power of meaning. And they have that private coach conversations. They can log their successes. There's support there if they have any crisis or setbacks. And they've created a setback plan that goes into effect. Again, there's support people and resources for them. All that personalized practice, interactive exercises, a tracking calendar, a journal, the worldwide discussion forum, and everything for continuing forward that we call Reclaim Plus. Ongoing assessments with reports, what to do in times of triggers, and all the specialty modules, some for those who are single, some for who are married, and then some for those that may have the religious and celibate life. They receive weekly messages with podcasts and new information. So what it is, is pulling together all the faith practices of the Catholic Church, specifically theology of the body, with the brain science, and you have reclaimed sexual health. And we're able to then say with Sirach, go not after your lusts, but keep your desires in check. It's time to stop sweeping this problem under the rug. We all have to get involved in this battle. So please help us spread the word about Reclaim Sexual Health. And you're able to join in this great endeavor to become a connected clergy member and congregation. You could become a faith friend on our program. But contact us if you want to add any contributions that you might have because there are so many needs we have to bring people into this hope and healing resource. We've worked out arrangements with Covenant Eyes, so if you want to try out that accountability software, you can type in Reclaim and get a 30-day free trial to see if you'd like that. And with Morality and Media to change our laws as the Catechism has instructed us to do or attend a program like this one. Please give us your email, go to reclaimsexualhealth.com and get involved and ask us questions and, and see what's coming next, like Proclaim Sexual Health for the prevention of getting involved in this. And in that, we have animated children's uh, images for the brain to teach them how to stay out of the pornography world and the pornography problem. So if you want more information, Reclaim Sexual Health or call 920-766-9380. Thank you. God bless.